Hello to you all and good afternoon. Whoever will join soon or just now will be more than welcome. And what we're going to do today, we're going to contemplate and understand deeply that part which is one of the most important uh, major course, major course if we can call it, of Kabbalah, which is understanding the different parts of the soul. So this is a major part, but we're going to take it a little bit in depth. And not only in depth, we're going to understand practically, I'm going to bring it down to this world, how we're going to actually use it in the everyday. What does it mean? Uh, I just don't want it to stand in the theoretical world, but rather what can we do with it practically? So we understand that usually we call the soul as one name, as one name, or in Hebrew, Neshama, right? But... Kabbalistically, we understand it's made of five different parts. Who cares? And what difference does it make? Well, it does. If I have a key, right, which should open the house or the car or whatever it is, and I look at that key, that key has got quite a few teeth, as you call it, to it. So if I just put the edge of it, it doesn't open. Only when I put the key all the way through, will that key turn in the knob and the door will open. The same applies to the soul. We have to understand those parts because those parts activate us. They reside in different parts of us as human beings. And we need to understand how do we function according to this? Yes, 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 we all do know, we all do know that currently we understand that there are seven chakras and SSFirot, 10 Sfirot, which we're going to definitely uh, learn soon, maybe already in the next session. But behind this, what sits behind this are five parts of our soul, five parts of our soul. So we welcome uh, newcomers with great pleasure. And you, and the way that this you to reflect so during those 10 minutes concept and then you can write down jot down you know only kind of question that you want reflections conflicts anything you want to dispute i'm open to it and then open it to your comments and discussion after about 10 minutes because that's about the the length of one meal that you can chew on and then therefore understand it and have some time to reflect with the others and with me uh, those people that are not here can later on see it through the youtube as it was. So we said there's actually, we call generally that soul neshama, right? Neshama. And we have to understand those names, those names in Hebrew and excuse my English, uh, I'm being serious and not cynical. In English, George, Jane, John are names. They are rigid, arbitrary names that were given, but does it have a meaning? Unfortunately, it doesn't. In French, in English, in Russian, any other language. But in the Hebrew, when you call something a name, it has a very specific deep meaning. And the Sfono, which is one of the early commentators of the, on, the, on the Torah and the Bible, some 800 years ago, who was also a commentator, as well as a Kabbalist, he says that the name carries in it the role, the role of the person, in other words, the goal that we need to accomplish, as well, as well, as the essence of the thing, in other words, it's got the potential for you to accomplish that, that mission, that tikkun, that uh, rectification God Hashem wants from you, as well as showing you what is the aim of your life, right? For example, somebody's Hebrew name, for example, mine in Hebrew is Gil, which means in Hebrew joy. It means this is my essence, but also it's my goal to have a very, very happy life. And so with anyone else in the Hebrews got him meaning. Coming back to the soul, which is the general name that we give to the soul, which we're going to go into this now, is called Neshama. Neshama in Hebrew, Neshama means Nun Shma. Its name, Shma means its name is what? Nun. What is Nun? Nun is that Hebrew letter which, which actually signifies and, and represents 50 gates. 50 gates of what? 50 gates of Bina, of understanding. Bina is not a male role. Bina is a feminine role. 
is the left side of our brain. When we say isha binatayetera, a woman's emotional intelligence, understanding one thing from the other, fathoming what you do with what you have, is a special feminine understanding. And so the soul in the Hebrew is feminine. In the English, you know, feminine and masculine, not for dogs, not for cars, not for souls. But in the Hebrew, we have to understand it's feminine. Why is it feminine? Because it's receiving all that godly light from Hashem, from God. So it's in a receiving end. From my perspective, when I get my soul every morning, when I wake up and I wash my hands, that soul can be very masculine, meaning it activates and it gives me its purity. But from God's perspective, the giver, right, it's very feminine because it has to receive from him, very much like this cup. This cup has a vessel. If this cup was a tray, anything inside it will spill. It has to have depth. It has to have that depth in its capacity to hold. And so the deeper the soul is, and yes, we are of different souls, the more capacity I have for the good and for the bad. By which, what do I mean? We know that Kabbalah of today was handed down through the Ariya Kadosh, this great Kabbalist lived some 500 years ago. And he stated that he came to this world especially for his best pupil, student, which was Rabbeinu Chaim Vital, Rebbe Chaim Vital. Now, at the age of 26, he was a genius, but he says about himself in autobiography, I could have been an alchemist. I could have been a shaman. I could have really gone to the black magic. I could have. I had such a terrible yet so horror inclination. I could have destroyed the world, but I chose not to. I chose not to. And when he came to Ariya Kodesh in Sfat, some five hundred years ago, he rejected him. He felt he's not ready because he looked at him as a grocer. He said, ha, in his mind, how can I learn Torah from a grocer? So Ari said, told him some secrets about him. And when he was crying from the depths of his soul, please accept me, Rabbi. He said, no, go home, repent, fast, and come back. Let's see if there's a real change inside you. I can't bear this. I can't bear you looking at me condescending from the top. It's nothing to do with me. It's got to do with you. In order for you to receive, to be a soul, a receptive vessel, you need to accept. So the first part of us in that soul, which we call in Hebrew neshama, and it resides, it's very important, it resides in the pituitary gland behind my third eye. And when the fontanel, where um, usually a man puts on that feeling, right? If you connect these two dots, where it goes inside, this is the seat of the soul. Who says so? The Ravad, Rabbeinu Avram, one of the great Kabbalists, in his introduction to the book of creation, handed to us 4,000 years related to Avram, our forefather, he told us the seat of the soul is right there. I'll give you uh, an anecdote about it. When I was very, very young, some two years ago, when I was about 21 or two, and I was in yeshiva in South Africa, I wanted to start my day very early. So I went with a chavrutha, with a certain person sitting with me, and at five in the morning, we started our day, at five in the morning. And so I had terrible headaches. I went to my rabbi, and I said to him, I don't understand. There's nothing wrong with me. I went to a doctor. I can't understand. He said, Gil, what time do you put on your tefillin? Which means this is the connection between you, your soul, and Hashem and God. He said, five. I said, it's way too early. He smiled. When you do this before the time before sunrise, or at least an hour before sunrise, you damage your soul. And I had a whole like bruise coming out between <coughs> excuse me, my third eye, which is the seat between my two eyebrows. And the minute that I stopped and I realized that, all my pains were gone. But I have a mark left there for the rest of my life reminding me, don't ever do this again. Connect to God before it is time because that halakha, the Jewish law actually dresses up and tells you when is the right time to connect. So as I showed you before, Showed you before, I need to have all the parts of my soul because it's like a key. Because this key has got quite a few teeth. Not, it's not going to open the door there. Only when everything goes through, then it will click and open. So the first part of my soul 
is called the Neshama, right? And it holds all the different powers. We don't condescend, we don't think we better. Each one is unique in his own way, but a connection of a Jewish soul is through 613 mitzvot, commandments to God. In other words, we are quite complex human beings, not because we want to, because that's the way we'll be created. There's an expectation, you know, in the American or Israeli or other places, other kind of modern Western nations, we have rights. According to Kabbalah, we don't have so many rights. We have more obligations and responsibility because the greater your soul, the more is expected of you. When it comes to somebody who's non-Jewish, right, who's definitely got a godly soul, a divine soul inside him, no question about it. But his connection or her connection to God is made up only of seven strings connection to God. When somebody wants to go out of the body, which is called chuta kesef, right, the silver lining of leaving the body behind and going out, right? We allow that soul to come out from here and we actually visually, we can feel it, we can acknowledge that seat of the soul. So to summarize, animals don't have a soul. Animals have an nefesh, an animalistic kind of spirit. They feel, they're very intelligent, they can cry, they have feelings, absolutely. And we also do, but they do not share a godly soul. The reason is because this is a real divine spark. When I leave my body after 120, that soul in me is going to always be there. It's eternal, it can never die. But an animal or a plant, so much more so inanimate, after 120, what's left, it doesn't go to the next world. Yes, we understand animals can go to a very lowly world, which we might learn also about today, but I can't share with them the same depth, the same feelings, the same understanding, the same sanctity that I was given. Again, not as a right, but as an obligation, as a responsibility of mine towards creation, towards my impact, my influence, becoming an influencer, not only being influenced in this world, because that's where I joined forces. That's why I was made in God's image, meaning I've got this incredible soul inside me. And again, if you're going to ask, well, we all share the same soul, and the answer is no. We don't share the same soul. Each one of us has different kind of a soul. For example, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, he had a soul that you can weigh on the scales, so the Zohar tells us, weighing 600,000 souls. And if you read his name backwards, Moshe, it's Hashem. He was the only person ever reaching this godliness and prophecy of these incredible heights that nobody could. And when we ask about his stuttering, well, he's a cripple, no. He was so elevated that he couldn't formulize and bring down and translate the incredible, eternal, infinite concepts. He saw update Mount Sinai also prophecy down to this world. That's why he did Aaron, his brother, to translate it back into the common language of today. This is a very important thing. So to summarize just the first part of the soul, we will call it Neshama, which means 50 gates of wisdom. Right. By the way, almost nobody, nobody ever achieved that height. The only one that attests that he did completely was King Solomon, Shlomo Amelech, that he arrived at the 50th gates of wisdom. We can all strive. We must realize, however, we must realize, however, that hi, Mike. We can real, realize, however, that in our that generations back back when they left Egypt, people, people like um, those that left Egypt were in 49 gates of, of defilement, 49 gates of misery and impurity. And they had to come out of 49 gates. They didn't achieve the 50th gate. Today, the Rechaim HaKadosh, one of the holiest people ever, is telling us that we need to achieve the 50th gate. Similarly, comparing to this, facing this, God Hashem has created also worlds of impurity, of Tuma. 
our function in our day and age is to take out people who have arrived at the 50s minus gate and bring them up all the way to the 50s. This is very important. So again, to summarize what from Michael Ray, who just joined us, a writer and a composer of music, I understand. Welcome, as well as Batya. And that is, Shalom Aleichem. And that is that the 49th gate, that those people were, while in Egypt, the Israelites, is that gate of idolatry, that gate of adultery. Today, we're touching on a different sphere completely. It's the 50th gate of defilement of Tumah, which means people around us, they don't have any appreciation or meaning. Is the God at all. We don't connect to anything. Atheism, evolution. They don't, they forgot, they lost completely, <coughs> excuse me, the direction in this world completely. And from there, we have the responsibility as well as the ability to bring those people out to ourselves. And therefore, that first part of the soul, the cities in the pituitary gland, behind my third eye and behind, underneath the place where I put on that feeling. And I can reach the highest levels. And people like the Josemi Lublin, the visionary of Lublin, who covered his eyes for seven years for pure purity reasons. When he finished those seven years, he became blind physically, but he could see his granddaughter in clear colors and saw her in vision as if she was right in front of him through his third eye. So we can reach very high levels even today. It all depends on you and how much we clean our own windows, our own glasses. The more I clean myself, the more I purify who I am, the higher I can get, right? Not every person that yesterday just opened the world and said, I'm Baba Sali, and I'm the greatest ever. Slowly, slowly, it takes a work of years. So till here, right, let's open it to a little bit of discussion, reflection, as I said at the beginning, for those who join us, Maya and Michael, give about 10 minutes, quarter of an hour of discussion, and then I open it to you, reflection, whatever you want to say, and then we carry on. I don't conflict, whatever you have to say is great. I want to add something to what you said. Yes, Dr. Uh, from the beginning, uh, the analogy with the key. So if I have a son and a, key and a car, and I give my car key to my son, and he's eight, he's incapable of driving this, my car. Right. But if I give the same car to the same son, and he's 21, his chances to be able to drive that car is much higher than when he's eight. So according to my understanding, just reflecting back what you said, is the Kabbalah is, 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 is the Kabbalah is kind of like I'm able to receive. You know, people sometimes want love, want prosperity, want health, want mental mental balance, but they're not ready to receive. And part of the preparation with Kabbalah is to form ourselves to become a vessel to be able to receive. In the holistic, um, I just like to make the connection. Yes, the part of it is grounding. Like take the first story for an example, you being tired after a day of work, talking all day, not eating, coming home tired and hungry. And then you know, the kids, mom, 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 oh, dad, 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 dad. And your capacity to respond to it differently than when you're rested or when you took a break or you took a shower and came back is much different because you are much more grounded. So if you think about, you know, some people when we speak about elevating the soul or have much more capacity, sometimes the ego is like, how come they, they become like this? How come they, how it's possible there are such a, a, a strong, amazing soul. And it's really about the capacity of the soul, how much a person can handle according to the vessel, to the, 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 the instrument he's holding. Absolutely. So I just wanted to bring that from a different perspective Thank you. Uh, to make the connection. Anyone else? Michael, uh, Maya, Batya. Yeah, Michael, please go ahead. Welcome. I have uh, just something to add uh, to what the doctor uh, just said, what she touched on. Um, the spiritual capacity that we have is very much based on uh, what we could do with this vessel, with our physical vessel. Uh, me personally, I uh, have uh, you know several uh, severe disabilities, most of which are affecting my spine. So sorry to hear. It's actually a blessing in disguise uh, the way I look at it now. Because it has helped me, it forced me really to 
learn about these things and be able to apply them in my life in a certain manner to which I didn't even understand I was doing some of these things until I started, uh, you know, studying Kabbalah. Oh, beautiful. And one of the things that, uh, you know, you said, reaching elevated states of consciousness, um, I, you know, uh, on my own have experienced such, you know, changes in perception and consciousness. But I think one of the biggest things is that, like you said, purifying this vessel so that we can be a better conduit for the spirit and the divine to shine through, almost Absolutely. like the way it shines through a prism and you get a rainbow. Those are all, if you use that metaphor, the rainbow is like all of the characteristics of the creator that we can shine through us. So I, just wanted to I like that. it. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Anyone else? Batya, Maya, you want to share something? Or oh, don't be shy. Well, why uh, did you skip over Maya. the human nefesh? Right. So, so as, as I said, we only touched on the first one, which is the general term, which is the soul. Of course, also in the English, we don't only have a soul, but we also have a spirit. And not only that, even in the English, we have what we call animalistic spirits, right? We have it by the Hindus, we have it by the Indians, American Indians, and we definitely have it by Kabbalah. Now we're going to go into it. My, uh, Batya, any kind of reflection or can I cannot carry on? Don't be shy. One, two, auction, sold. So what we have is we actually have five teeth to this key which opens us and each one of them it's all godly. It's all God-given. They are all of equal understanding and being shined on by divine light. Nevertheless, when they come into our body, they act differently, very much as a source. Let's imagine that I want from this room to shine a projector out towards other rooms. <coughs> Let's imagine the people staying in this house, kids or guests or students, each one in a different room. One says, yeah, I want to read all the way to 12 a.m. The other one says, no, no, I, I want to just have very dim light to watch some kind of a YouTube. And one says, let me go to sleep. So with the same projector, this is very important, with the same projector, I can make sure that the first room gets most of the light. The second room will get a dimmer light and the third room will almost get no light. The same exact analogy applies to your soul, meaning, <coughs> excuse me, just a bit of a cold, no COVID, thank God. So the first part of the soul is situated, as I said, in my pituitary gland, it's called the soul, <coughs> and its function, its role is to give me aspiration, which are completely divine. It's to catch me and say, Gil, why do you do such a thing? It's my moral campus. It's my seeking for something more spiritual in my life. We all know, and if we don't, we can learn now about the hierarchy of Maslow, which is the highest, most people just, you know, activate themselves with survivalship. Other people already look for love and relationship. Higher people, higher in their evolution, look for something like intellectual pursuits or philosophical. And he didn't mention, because in Get the Maslow, that's one out of a hundred get to intellectual pursuits to do what they want with it. One out of the thousands, the Talmud says, gets to function and to achieve their spiritual pursuits, which is incredible. So when you get this inner good voice that says, Gil, why did you do this? Gil, you shouldn't do that, right? And we all have that inner good voice. That coming down from my soul because it's completely pure to the point that we know about Kabbalah, when a person wants to go astray, when a person wants to do things that he knows according to his moral campus shouldn't be done, that soul immediately leaves you. Many of us believe that we're going to get our reward. Think about the soul, I'm very focused. Many of us will get reward for what we do in the next world, heavens. Whether be Jewish or non-Jewish, makes no difference. But the truth Kabbalah says is the minute that I sin right now, sinning in Hebrew means chet, which means are straight off from our aim, from our goal. And each one of us has got a different goal. Be sure about it. We yes, there is a major, right, 
a kind of highway for all of us, right? The Ten Commandments and others. But one is an artist. Michael is an artist. He's a, he's a writer. He's a musician. Other people do other things, right? And therefore, whatever you do, this is your calling. And I can't do it for you. You're great. You're unique in what you do. I, I don't even understand what you do. And that's the calling of your soul. The next level down, right, is your spirit. Spirit in Hebrew is called Ruach, which means this is the spirit and its seat is in your heart. So the heart, we know, for example, that when a person gets a heart attack or an anxiety, a panic anxiety, right? So where does it come from? It's got nothing to do with the physical. What? Seriously? What did you say? Huh? I can die just from stress or panic attack, as people do. The seat of that spirit is in my heart. It's the seat of my conscience. When Who says this? Professor Viktor Frankl in A Man in Search of Meaning. When I have a moral dilemma, not a, not a preference, but a moral dilemma, is it the right thing to do? Is it the wrong thing to do? Am I going to hurt anyone or not? That seat is in my heart. When I have an emotional relationship, when I want to be sensitive to other people, when I want to have a real motivation, all this come out of my heart. My mind does not have motivation. My mind is a calculator. It's got inspiration, but motivation, my engine, Kabbalistically, is in my heart. And the Bible many times says, this man's got a heart of a lion. You say a mind of a lion or legs of a lion, a heart of a lion. And some of you here that know that you did martial arts or other things, other pursuits, you know that your opponent can be much stronger but because you've got a lion's heart, like in David, you'll be the winner because you are persistent. How did Churchill say it in the Shira Day lesson of Kabbalah? Churchill said, success in life is jumping, skipping from one failure to the next without any disappointment. The church, and he was a wise guy, wise man. So that seat is in my heart. It's the seat of consciousness. It's my moral campus. It's my, it's my emotional seat. <clears throat> and it acts like a funnel and a bridge between my mind, my soul, my intellectual capacity, my spiritual capacity, and my activating and bringing things to fruition. This is the reason, by the way, that most, many men, and I can tell you from experience, and I'm also in that part being called the man, right, need a woman in their life, or many men are not in connection with the heart, not in connection with the feelings. That's why we need music. That's why we need art. That's why we need to have a, a, a real heart-to-heart -heart conversation, usually with a woman. The reason is because that funnel of a man is usually much smaller than that of a woman. And the result of it is aggression, addictions, men's addictions, absolutely seriously. There's a subject called medical Kabbalah, which I teach for many years, and there we address those questions of how to heal those issues, because we understand everything that you have inside you, as Michael cleverly, smartly said it, is just a con, you're just a vessel. It's a dress up on something spiritual, emotional. And if you don't address the emotional, psychological, or spiritual, you will always deal with symptoms. You will never deal with the root cause. The next seat, which we're going to discuss, and I'm going to open it to your questions, the lowest one is called the nefesh. Nefesh in English will be the animalistic soul. Its seat is in the lover, that's Kabbalah. And when we're full of ego, when I ask for your respect, when I get angry, when I feel guilt, shame, blame, when I get jealous, when I want to have vengeance, when I want to be grudge, when I have food addiction, or I'm just addicted to food, I just want more and more, right? Any kind of obsession that brings me down, that draws me down all the way to the malistic. So that's very simple. Just one push into Facebook, Instagram, any of the social media or internet, and the person faces all of his or his uh, animalistic kind of lusts and desires. Even the, the greatest of all men that walk this earth, whether it's Moses, or anyone else, Abraham, whoever it was, we are not free from fighting against this animalistic thing, anger, being strict, 
being vengeful, being jealous of other people, food addiction or, or any kind of physical desire, and you, whatever your imagination brings up, this is it. The seat is in that uh, lever of us. And this is the greatest fight of a human being. But we have help. What is the help? All these three that we discussed now, I said at the beginning there's five, so all these three that we discussed now, the soul, which is in my pituitary gland, from there it sends an enlightenment to my intellect. The brain, my mind, is only an enlightenment from a spirit. Some people are very bright, incredibly geniuses, but they're not spiritual. Professor Stephen Hawkins, for example, he was an incredible genius. I studied him at the university already at 20 years of age, but he was an atheistic. He was very, very intellectual, much more than me, much brighter, but he was not spiritual at all by definition of his own. So some people are very spiritual, but not intellectual, others the other way, and some can merge the two, which is what God actually wanted. As to have both, that intuition, that inspiration, that divine calling, what is my mission on earth, right? And to have something spiritual in it, whatever you define as spirituality, which you have to define. Then the intellect, that's soul, neshama. Then your spirit, ruach, which is your emotional seat in your heart and the seat of your consciousness, or your conscious rather. And then the lowest part, the mystic part, which sits in the liver, which draws you down every day of your life and you have to, wake up even in your 95 years of age. And somebody told me today that when you're 120, what do you wish somebody to have, have a great day? Oh, how much can you wish them all? But in that great day, they can mess up the entire life in what they do. So these are the three given parts of the soul, your reflection, and then we can go further. Please go ahead. Any reflection, any questions there are uh, welcome. Maya, Michael, Batya, Shiri. Yes, Michael, go ahead. I just wanted to, uh, sorry, I don't know if you could hear me. Um, Absolutely. I wanted to comment quickly on uh, something you touched on uh, briefly. The animalistic part of the soul, I believe, goes all the way back to uh, even uh, the story of Adam and Eve. Let's just imagine for a second, we are Adam or Eve, if a man or a woman, right? And we we have these desires because we have a physical body, and yet we're still in a paradisical state. So we're still right. in a higher state than we are today, and yet we have this inclination, and we know, and then Adam and Eve were able to put together not only the intellect and the spirit in knowing that they had to lower themselves, they had to actually descend below where they were yes. and, and to actually have knowledge of the fact that there is a lower world, I think it is what's, you know, big. And the psychoanalyst um, <clears throat> Carl Jung or Jung, uh, he uh, touched on a lot of this. Yes, he did. And uh, when he was talking about uh, the shadow self, the shadow work that, uh, and I forget if it was him or another who said. It was, Carl, it was Carl Jung because Freud didn't touch on it. And not, not either uh, Adler, only Carl Jung. He was very spiritual. He learned Kabbalah. It's him in all yeah. his books. Yeah. It's all over the show. Yeah. Yes. And there was another man who said, some people don't find God because they don't look low enough. And I think, <laughs> <That's beautiful. laughs> I, I think that is a, a testament, uh, it, sorry to use that word ironically, to the fact that God is everywhere, that spirit still exists even on that lowest realm uh, of existence. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have to yes. keep pulling like myself you mentioned medical kabbalah also as well i have to constantly you know from hour to hour remind myself to keep pulling in that uh higher uh 
uh, knowledge from the intellect. And no, absolutely, I can only share with you. First of all, uh, I really appreciate your sharing, and I'm sure, and then I'm very sorry to hear about your pain, which is a constant one. But I can share with you what I said to one of my patients or clients uh, two weeks ago. So which is, he's been an autoimmune problem for many, many years. Today's 25, from almost the day that he was born. Hmm. He is much more mature and greater than any of his peers, any of his friends, because he had to work against resistance for most of his life. He appreciates, he cherishes every day, every relationship. He appreciates the fact that he can walk, that he can see, that whatever he can do. And most of us, we don't. We just take it for granted. We're beautiful, we're pretty, we're smart, we're rich, we're strong. But people that suffer, like you sharing with us, and thank you for sharing, a lot. You appreciate love so much. You appreciate every relationship, every piece of knowledge, wisdom that you can get. So that makes you greater and bigger in that respect. And so it's not a, you know, some kind of certificate or diploma of poverty on the contrary. It's a diploma of greatness. I, for example, have got my own uh, challenge with lactose and with dairy products. So I've got a different attitude about it. I don't say, well, I can't have all this cheese. No. God has taken me away. I don't have to do that. I can do other things. I can do vegan. I can do soy. I can do other things. I don't have to go there. No, why can't I? No, I don't have to go there. You and I, we share glasses, also wear glasses for driving, whatever it is. People that don't, you know, this costs quite costly, a few hundred bucks. We're not better than anyone else. I'm crippled when I have to wear my own glasses, which I do. I mean, other people that can see better. So people that are suffering, they're so much greater because they really do participate. There is a book, unfortunately, it's an Hebrew narrative. It's a doctor of psychology. She wrote it in the Hebrew. <coughs> she made a PhD on it. It's called The Winning Story. She took 100 celebs that had terrible stories, especially when it comes to death, mourning, grief, and this is disease, and how they turned around their lives into a winning story, such as the chief of, chief of justice in Israel, a professor. Right, owner and others. So moving forward, moving forward, the question is, the question is, how am I going to rectify? In Hebrew, it's called the tikkun. How am I going to rectify those three parts? Because I'm not here to suffer. I'm not here only to say, well, this is the way it is. I'm not a deterministic human being. I've got my own free choice. What do I do about it? How do I manage with it? So this is very interesting. Now we're going to introduce. If it's too much for you, I'm going to hold back. If it's too much I want to. I want to add something. Yeah, please do. Um, sure. Yeah. So I, I like to bring that into a different um, perspective because it's all about different perspectives. Uh, continuing in the same line uh, that we're discussing. So when we suffer, when we're in pain, when we're angry, when we're frustrated, when we hate, love, and all this yucky emotions or great emotions they are kind of like a navigator and that's inviting you to do what to pay attention to have a different dialogue with emotions because anger is not a bad emotion unless you have nothing to do with it and you don't know what to do with it and how to channel it how to redirect it it's become a, a negative feeling so the pain covid challenges if it's food allergy if it's physical uh, disabilities or challenges are inviting you to pay attention, kind of like a, a cop, which is a good cop, obviously, and looking to redirect you. Hey, pay attention, have a different dialogue, see what you can understand and navigate and redirect and recreate from the situation. Because I'm here to serve you, I'm here to help you. When somebody is angry, usually it's because he compromises boundaries he neglected or suffocated for a certain subject or a person or situation for a long time. So these feelings or situation and the pains are all for us. All the world is for us. So whatever is in your surrounding and you're facing as individuals, it's a kind of like a wake up call. I call it a call from the White House telling you, pay attention. Let's have a di dialogue. Let's have a cup of coffee or tea or whatever you want to drink. Sure. And Let's pay attention to what's going on. Cheers. So beautiful. I absolutely agree. So now I'm going to start to talk to you about the tikkun. The greatest, one of the greatest concepts in Kabbalah is, okay, that's what we have. But what do I do about it? How do I rectify my situation for where it is 
to a higher state of being. And therefore the results will be that my health, my the four areas of life, my health, my relationships, my career, and my spirituality, which usually is growth and contribution, we will be on a higher level. So I've got an interest why to change. From God's perspective, it's opposite way around. In other words, the egg is very important. The egg comes before the chicken. What does that mean? God has created the problem for you to rise up to another level. And once you understand the next level and you rectify spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, that level, the physical will ease or will change completely, right? And therefore, we have to do that work. Say, why is God not fair to me? Why is it cruel to me? Whatever it is, it's a different discussion. But in short, if you'd like some answers about it, God loves all of us equally the same, all children of God. He doesn't prefer anyone to anyone else. Our own actions, and again, I'm speaking to myself about myself, our own actions, Previous reincarnations, we don't remember. I don't remember. Thank God I don't remember. In previous life or in this life brought this to us. I'll give an example. A young man that visited my offices today and that was left by his girlfriend and he's suicidal and very angry and very depressed about it. I said, why did you do it to me? I asked him for the last three, four years when your relationship with this young girl, did you betray her as well? Oh, yeah, plenty of times. And how did she feel about it? Well, she was very, very hurt. So this is called karma. When we do certain actions, it's not God that brings us a punishment. The, the rule, the law of karma brings upon us the same or the other way around. Sometimes we're too good. We're too nice. We look for crumbs. We want to appease other people. So we give all the love in the world in order to get back a few crumbs. And the wake up call, as Shirley called it, is I don't have to give my whole self just to get some free crumbs. I respect myself enough to have good, positive, self, healthy love. And therefore I can also love others. I'm sharing my love with you. But I don't have to look for crumbs to give you the whole deal and get back just a few crumbs. So how do I rectify this in calling Hebrew nar Naran? Naran means the Neshama, the soul, the Ruach, which is the spirit, and the holistic soul, which is called the Nefesh. What is it called the Nefesh in Hebrew? I told you before, Every word in Hebrew has a very deep meaning. Nefesh comes from the word nefisha, lazy, drawn to sadness. I want to do nothing. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to do anything. Where does this animalistic spirit get it from? First of all, like Michael said, from this world. The lion, for example, the king of all animals, well, he's not really a king that much. He sleeps, if you read a bit of National Geographic's or Wikipedia, he sleeps for 20 hours a day. Is the lioness which goes for prey. And when he wakes up, he eats, he has a relationship with his wife, the lioness, and he goes to sleep again. Because most of the time he wants to sleep. So the animalistic soul wants to sleep. Moreover, once we are out of this body, there's complete rest. There is no more work. The work is only in this body. Why? And this is a very important issue and concept. I have got a certain shape, which we discussed in privilege, to my soul. Yes. But I cannot change my condition in any of the higher worlds because there is no physical movement. Only once I join and I engage spiritual with physical, logic with emotions, sky heavens with us in this body, can I make a real change? For example, let's say that I was born, I wasn't, but let's say I was born very stingy. And whenever it comes to giving money, sweets, anything to anyone, my hand is just sealed. I can't do it because my nature is one of being very stingy. I can't change it forever. I will stay this way. The only way of doing it is through modification of the behavior, which means I force myself against my nature, going upstream to... Change my actions. One of yours, yours professors has shared and said, only dead fish go with this flow. So I have to be a live fish and go against the flow, force myself and say, well, I'm going to start giving a little bit here, a little bit. And with time and inertia and energy, the motion will turn into a motion and I'll be able to change the shape of my soul. In other words, this is a very important, deep concept. 
my physical self through my animalistic soul is not only there for me to educate it and to train it like a horse. No, it's to train my soul through the animalistic soul doing actions repeatedly again and again, which are sharing, giving, being compassionate, understanding, listening, sensitive, respectful to different people, different cultures, different religions, right? I will be able to change the shape of my soul forever. For example, you should all watch, I'm sure you did, the, the Schindler list. This guy was a real Nazi and he was not giving at all. But at the end of the movie, right, as a German Nazi, he's like, give me just a few more dollars or francs, whatever it is, that I, I could have bought another, I could have saved another life of two Jewish people. What in time? It was, it was really crying, it's a real story. He's buried today in Jerusalem. And I really envy this kind of man. He's a great, great man, a great man because he was able to force himself against all odds, against being pursued and killed for saving other lives that were pursued by the Nazis because he was such a great soul, because he did actions repeatedly, he saved 6,000 people. Today, around Israel, there are over 600,000 people that came off from the 6,000 that he saved. 6,000 people the man saved, 6,000. Who can, how can I stand next to such a man? He's a great man. That's what he could do. So the first level of my animalistic soul, the way that I can fix it is by me, for example, doing a physical action with the intention, with the intention of including in it something spiritual. For example, whether people are Jewish or non-Jewish, people sit around before they take anything to the mouth, whether it's Starbucks, or cutie, or any kind of food, we say a blessing. The blessing means in Hebrew, I acknowledge you, God, at the source of my blessing, and I want to connect with you. It's just my intention. I do the same action. I want to do some fundraising. I want to give a charity to a homeless guy. I can do it and say, you know, I feel so bad for the guy. Let me give him a dollar, get him out, get, get away from him. No. When I do it, I have to force myself to think, I have the intention, this is a godly creation, that he's miserable and his luck is so terrible. Let me help him along. Even though he just one dollar, but it's what I've got. But I really want to do an act of charity, an act which has got a God and a spark in it. And therefore by doing it with the right intention, I elevate my animalistic soul. Every time I resist something which is like chocolate, ice cream, any physical temptation which I know I fall in and I fight with myself every single day and I, and I accentuate day because people let's say out of addiction in rehab, they count days. We also count days and every one of us got an addiction obsession somewhere which is physical. Every day that goes by and I mark it off and I say, I want today, I didn't fall into this. That's a great win of the animalistic soul. And it celebrates with you because you're able to change who you are. And after two, three weeks of doing so, whether it's sugar addiction or any kind of addiction, you're going to be free of that addiction and become much easier. You're, not, you're going to forget about it, especially if you've got kids and they were born and you can see that you want to train and educate them. They were born with certain kind of templates of very bad attributes and you help them along. They're not going to remember how you channel them, sometimes a bit of strength towards the right direction, but you did out of love in a, in a loving way. And therefore you changed who they are. The higher form is of your spirit, that part of emotions. <coughs> I touch and activate this when I have the right emotion. For example, I want to open us Psalms and I say Psalms number 23. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. If I say it this way, there is no connection with God. There is no connection with my spirit. I'm not really saying, I'm just reciting a psalm. I'm copy pasting. There is no involvement of your divine spirit. But if I say differently, even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of this, I will see no evil. For you are with me, God, the Lord of my... When I say it with intention, when I involve my feelings, right? You look into your, your significant other's eyes and say, I love you. I love you too. What does it mean? It means nothing. Or to your child's eyes, to your friend's eyes. It means nothing. But if you involve your heart, you activate it, you change. 
prayer by definition in the Kabbalistic view, it's called the work of the heart. Many people are much brighter than me, much. I have friends that I grew up with, brilliant, much brighter than me. But if a person goes with one day, Kabbalah says, and doesn't activate his heart, for example, meditation, or a few lines of prayer, where you activate your heart, yes, your brain, your mind has worked, but your spirit, your emotions weren't activated. And especially for men, this is so important because we are lacking that element. So I understand, I'm sure somebody like Michael, who's a writer and is a musician, that's the language of the heart. Absolutely. Kabbalah says that if you do not understand the language of music, you can never understand the secrets of Kabbalah. It goes hand in hand. The next level is of your soul. When I, for example, want to say a blessing on this, I want to acknowledge God. So the first level is I put some kind of a spark of sanctity into it when I do the physical action or giving charity or saying a blessing. I just don't shove it into myself as an animal. The animals do the same. Just <laughs> go for it and drink. When I engage my emotions, I activate my spirit. When I engage my thoughts and my soul, my, my inspiration, and say, well, I'm full of gratefulness. These waters came all the way from the springs somewhere down there in the Grand Canyon in Arizona, wherever it came from. And I'm so grateful to you, but I'm connecting to this. Through this, I'm connecting to you. How come? This is very important. If I go to the gas station, and I'm using somebody, one of the workers that to help me along. And I don't open my gas tank, open my mouth and I say, fill it up, 87. I say, excuse me, sir, I'm gonna call an asylum. You must be out of your mind. How is it? This is very crucial. How is it that I eat physical food and that food can nourish my soul? My soul is completely spiritual. My thoughts are completely spiritual. How can physical food address my thoughts? nourish my soul. They don't. They don't. And therefore Kabbalah teaches us by engaging my intention, my thoughts, my the spark of godliness in me in every physical action, something in that physical food, drink, is reactivated and that feeds my soul. Not the gas. If I come there and I just ask for gas in my mouth, well, that's an asylum. Right? That's being mad. But if I know, and how do I do it? Through a blessing, through an acknowledgement, through understanding what is the source of my food, of my nourishment, through gratefulness, through meditation, through prayer, then I activate my soul. And you see on a person's face that they shine. They shine away. These are really the holy people between us, amongst us, that the aura shines. Now, till here, any comments, reflection, conflicts, disputes, hey, happy to hear. Michael Shirley Meyer, that's the order that you appear in front of me. Don't be shy. Hmm. <clears throat> well, yeah, go ahead. I, I guess I have uh, just something to share uh, real quick. Um, again, about uh, the animalistic uh, nature uh, of just our, our vessel. Uh, we yes, can't. Sir need to uh, sustain it with food or nutrients or, or what, whatever it is. You mentioned there's nothing inherently spiritual about the food until we connect the higher with the lower. And what I think is very interesting to note is the way certain drugs or chemicals will affect the yes. brain. Yes, and, do. and alter states of consciousness. And there's been a lot of studies, uh, uh, particularly in America, uh, into uh, you know psychedelics, which are yes. a completely different class of drugs. <laughs> of their own. Different states of consciousness and mindsets, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, exactly. And um, one of the biggest things noted about that is something that you uh, it hit the nail on the head on is intention is you have to set your intention and your goal and what you want to get out of your uh, this uh, psychedelic experience which a lot of people call spiritual 
because right. you are in essence taking six uh, to 12 hours really to reflect on what's inside of you that is yes, being you do. outward so i think that's uh just the very same thing to note uh how that is a very literal representation of connecting the higher with the lower and Beautiful. Is- thank you for sharing my i have quite a few patients right now that are taking psychedelics this form or the other lowest right. form is grass and weeds and higher forms and higher forms like coke and heroin and others and the feeling or the, what they want to share with me the sense is that those people usually are very depressed they've got a dark attitude about life it's not the fault sometimes this take was a very sensitive people to life Sometimes the girlfriend left, sometimes the career, whatever it is. And through taking those psychedelics, they really feel happy for that, as you mentioned, for that period of time. But the aftershot is, the repercussions is that after those few hours are gone, they go down into depression, suicide, and many times the pores, especially those pores of the cheeks, become wide open because you affect your lungs, your dermal lungs irreversibly and many times even there's like a twist in the mouth or in the face which can be irreversible because of it so in Kabbalah what we do is we try to swap or change or transform that animalistic desire into some kind of creation for example you are involved in creation which is incredible you're a writer you're a musician so you're able to get lots of inspiration and real satisfaction not pleasure which is money uh, uh, temporary, right? A word that we don't like so much because you, your creation during the time, you don't need anything else. Some people get you out of sport. Any person that's involved in creativity, in the Hebrew, we call the evil inclination yetzer, which means the desire which takes me over. And the transformation of it is called yetzer, which means how do I transform into creation? Because it's not conscious, it's in my subconscious, it's in my unconscious. And my subconscious, my feelings will always take over that intellect. They're always stronger. A person got a, fa- a fade love. Say so intellectually, I'm going to get away from this fade love. No, it doesn't happen. It doesn't help. They will go, emotions are stronger than thoughts. Who says so? Marissa Pierce, number one's world psych- uh, uh, hypnotherapist in England. She's got over 40 years of experience in the books and in the videotapes. And she's correct. But through actions, like CBT, right? Through actions, I can definitely overpower and channel, all right, rather say channel, and be very creative and understand from a negative inclination how to channel this in the right direction. And therefore, it's very interesting that in the Hebrew, the word for a king, I'm going to a king, is called Melech. Melech is made of three letters, M, in English, uh, Melech is M-E-L-E-C-H. M stands for the mind in the Hebrew, Moach, which means, yes, yes, I do have an animalistic soul residing in my level, pulling me down, drawing me down to what temptation and desire is physical. Yes, I have an emotions which overpower me, love, uh, blind love, whatever it is that's residing in my heart. But if I'm a Melech, a real Melech, which means I with my mind, I can navigate with emotional intelligence, not suppressing my emotions, no. Bringing down my intelligence, becoming emotional intelligence and maneuvering and and navigating my my feelings and my physical desires into some some high aspiration, channeling into something positive, that's great. And I'm a man which means my mind overrules, oversees, overpowers, overgoverns my heart oversees my animalistic desires. We're not about taking it away. We're not about suppressing them. No, because a person that is suppressed, you know, that's the source of aggression and and frustration and sadness. We're not about any kind of suppression in Kabbalah. We're about using it, navigating in the right way. However, so that's called Melech. Mind, heart, lover, or mind, soul, the seat of the soul, Spirit, which is the seat inside the heart, and the animistic soul, the seat in the liver. But if a person lets his heart rule him, and everything is from us, it's called a lemech. Lemech means somebody, what can we do, that follows only his heart. Heart is great. 
but if it's combined with emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence, which also Aristotle said that's the greatest of intelligence. I was asked in some kind of a conference, a few years back of chaplains, what is my greatest challenge? I had to think about it seriously and I answered the emotional intelligence. What do I say to which person, how much, what quality, what quantity? It's always true because you can really say the wrong things sometimes, attaching them to emotions and you regret it for the rest of your life. It's damage unrepairable. And the next level is if you really follow your desires, you become a clum. Nibu clum is that you are nothing, which means you let your physical desires define you. Control over your emotions, dictate your emotions, and therefore control and manage also your thoughts. To summarize, thoughts, spirituality should overrule, should overseer, should have emotional intelligence when you're dealing with your heart and your desires and your, and your emotions. And that should oversee and govern and channel your physical self through creativity. We're all made of flesh and blood. We're all made of flesh and blood, but we have to navigate. The difference between a great person and somebody who didn't make it is this kind of a session that you understand which way. I can tell you after being 16 years, one six in university and more than that in seminary, none of us were ever taught really, even though I learned psychology, no moral compass, no real change, no transformation of the self ever. I was never taught this. There is no such, yes, I learned, when I learned law, I learned ethics. Yeah, ethics of the law. But because I'm afraid of the law, I'm afraid of the police, but changing myself, transforming myself into a better human being, only Kabbalah. To your reflection, and then we'll call it a day. Tal, Shirley, Maya, Michael. I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm going to add something. Please do. With, without the yetzer, without the desire, we won't have kids. We won't have a generation. We won't eat, right? Somebody's not eating. We go to work. We, we, we won't do nothing. So like anything else, like self-confidence, you don't want high and you don't want low. Yes. You want a balanced one. Yes. Now, this to help to connect it to the healing process. There's right. no healing with no feelings. However, if you are not balanced, your, your feelings are not balanced and they're based yes. on trauma or pain or discomfort yes. or past experiences so we the, the healing process is really to create balance if somebody yes. injured we go into the hospital to create a physical balance if somebody is a, we call it a drama queen or a, cannot handle his emotions he's emotionally imbalanced when somebody mind is not clear can think fogginess uh, uh, can't think straight the mind is need to be balanced right and also spiritually because we are being affected by our surrounding, if we are aware of it or not. So it's really about finding balance and navigate that which is you know, controlling us and the desire that takes over us into a creation. And so it's not about it being a tree hugger. It's not about nullifying yourself from life. Absolutely. And dismiss life and go to an island and have a retreat for two months, not talking and not eating and not drinking. And that's not be life. Be Avoiding. <laughs> uh, you have to use it because if you don't use it, you lose it. But you have to be, have a reflection and observation to pay attention to how you live and how you talk and how you feel and what's handling your life instead of being influenced by your emotion, by your environment, by your thoughts and by your feelings, you are influencing your life. And that's the art of the Kabbalah, to be able to be ready to recabel on you some discipline. To receive. Yes, yeah. y yes, yes. I will just give you a short example, which is great from Psalms to David. If I've got jealousy, for example, it seems to be a very bad attribute. But Kinat Sufim, if I've got jealousy of other writers, not because you have, I want to take it away from you, saying, I want to be like Michael. Like Michael, I want to write. I want to be a musician. I want greatness. I don't take anything away from him. I want to emulate him. That's, N that's NLP. If he can do it, I can also do it. That's great. Be jealous, but against yourself, understand, facing, understand your potential. Let me also do it. Let me also strive for greatness. Let me not waste my life. Let me make a difference. If I've got some kind of pride, usually say pride, arrogance is very bad. Ego, ego egotistical. But if I navigate and say, I demand of myself a higher standard, that's great. Before somebody's chosen the president of the United States, he lives in certain child as individual. Once chosen, the certain actions which are not acceptable. 
We are all the children of God. We've got internal, infinite soul. If you think about it, you say, I can't do that anymore. You know, God has entrusted in me this great responsibility, this great mission. Every day, every second that he's giving me this pulse in my heart, he's asking me for something. It's my duty. It's called duties of the heart to find out what is my mission. What is my, do something about it. This is my motivation. You can see in LinkedIn, I've got an article in English about motivation. It's not something external I'm going to listen to Will Smith or to Denzel Washington. It has to be internal. I'm so insulted, I don't want to go to sleep. I can't wait to wake up in the morning. I can't wait. I don't want to go to sleep because this is me. I'm living away my dreams. And these dreams have got something of spirituality in them. Maya or Mike and Tal, any statement, any reflection? And then we're going to call it today for today. Yes, please do. Don't be shy. I don't bite, usually. Um, I just have one quick uh, statement to make. Yes, sir. When it comes to uh, uh, desire, um, as a uh, musician or a as a writer, <laughs> a lot of the things that I uh, will write about, or, or, well, that I will find myself writing about, rather, uh, come from these core desires that I have in myself. And that is why I think How beautiful. People, people often say that uh, what somebody writes reveals more about them than it does about the story itself. Yes, and yes, beautiful. Uh, looking back at old songs I've written or uh, old writing, I realized it, it was really more a reflection it was me holding up a mirror to myself and where I was. How that. nice, how beautiful, beautiful. What kind of books do you write? You write books about the journey of the soul. What, what is your major goal in writing the books or your songs, if I can ask? Um, it, exactly that. It's connecting uh, science oh, beautiful. and reality um, and allowing people to really take a step back and objectively observe the truth that can be found in all religion and all spiritual disciplines and all philosophies. That's so beautiful. So you find your mission. And when you do that, you help, whether you're conscious of it or not, many other people like myself and others that will benefit from this. Whether we read your books or we are unaware of it, but Kabbalistically, we know all souls are connected in a real network. And when you raise yourself and you work at yourself and you bring it out, there's you are a radio station you're you re, you resonate with us and you know all these kind of energies comes from you know that huh ah, maybe look in the mirror when i was a kid and we're gonna end there i used to love to watch chinese movies in one of them i saw one of their champions it wasn't bruce lee it was somebody else he had to fight against different kind of people at the end he became the champion of the world and then they gave him a prize a prize that nobody has touched for thousands of years what was the prize? I remember as a child, a kid, I looked at it. Ah. He opened this book that was dusted and people didn't touch it for tons of him. When he opened it, he started laughing. It was a mirror on both sides of this incredible book. Just look at okay. yourself, realize your potential, bring it to fruition. And this is Chinese wisdom. And this is also Jewish wisdom. Find your own self. And what we're trying to do here is allow you to elevate yourself and bring up your potential, your uniqueness, not mine not somebody else's, yours and yours, you own it. And it's your right, your best right. And in a way, it's also your mission and your duty. Beautiful. So thank you so much. See you all next week. Maya, you want to say something or Tao, or we call it the day? Maya, Tao. One, two. Tao, thank so yeah, you. Yes, Maya. That You're welcome. Great. You're welcome, Thank Maya. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. God bless. Bye-bye.